Rose has just gone through some terrible events, driving from Virginia to Delaware in her pajamas and a coat. She can't help but sob behind the wheel. Hours go by, she recollects herself, stops by a deli shop, and realizes at the last minute that she forgot her wallet. Furious and anxious, she gets whatever she can with the cash from the car, forgets about responsibility, and gulps beer while driving. She gets to the beach then. Dreary gray shores, wind and waves perfectly reflect her inner atmosphere as she decides to spend the afternoon in a stranded lighthouse. After ascending stairs and finding a good spot, she opens another bottle to soothe her raging thoughts and drinks it with an appetite. Suddenly she hears a voice coming from upstairs. Someone is clearly shuddering from the cold. Deciding to check it out, Rose finds a young boy freezing on the cement floor. The boy is unresponsive, and no special knowledge is required of Rose to determine that he's going to freeze if she leaves him here. And so she takes him down, gets him in her back seat, covers him in blankets, and drives off. The boy wakes up as rain starts to fall. With a discernible British accent, he says that he doesn't want to go to a hospital. He also notices how drunk his savior is. Soon, they stop by a cafe to get to know each other better. The boy clearly loves literature, since he's reciting the first few sentences of Moby Dick for a good while to tell his story. According to this, he's a voyager, endeavoring to quiet the dark November in his soul. In another version, he's a male pr the third time, he says the truth, he came to America to see a girl, but before they could embark on a romantic journey, she got back with her ex-boyfriend. Now, the boy is stranded in America with nowhere to go and nothing to get by with. This is particularly frustrating for Rose, since she cannot leave him anywhere now, and the last thing she needs is a teenager who depends on her. Still, the boy tells her that she's pretty, and this reminds her of her husband. As it seems, he thought of her as pretty as well, he even married her for it, but then decided that he liked a shorter girl better and cheated on her. Now we understand why Rose is in this state. To take all her rage out, she calls her husband by pay phone outside, and a flurry of unarranged curse words start falling from her mouth. For a few seconds she stands there, screaming at her husband for breaking their marriage, and when the fury is expressed enough, she slams the phone back into place. We learn about the purpose of her driving trip in the next scene. As it seems, she came here to confront Emma, the girl her husband cheated on her with. After slamming her windows and doors, she walks around the house, screaming and threatening. Nobody opens the door, of course, and Rose drives away with the intention of coming back again later. Now she endeavors to go to her workspace. Accompanied by the silent boy on this unusual mission, she enters the space and learns that the girl doesn't work there anymore. The worker says, however, that he's about to start giving a tour around the brewery and offers them to tag along. Rose doesn't want it, of course, but the boy expresses excitement, so they agree. Taking a detour from the group, they steal some bottles of beer and drink far too many, until they lay down beneath one huge brew kettle. They clearly don't care about the consequences of their actions at this point. Later that day, Rose takes the boy to her parents' summer house. After a while, a fire is made and the storm outside is left behind. As the wind shakes window panes, Rose tries to find something to eat, and the boy spends some time by himself by the hearth. Suddenly, Rose does something unexpected. She sends him upstairs to get a coat for her, and while he's gone, she checks his wallet. The thing is filled with money, and without thinking much, she takes some out to get food. Instead of going to a store right away, however, she drives over to Emma's house again and waits for her arrival there. Meanwhile, the boy turns over Rose's house and finds a bunch of interesting stuff. It is already dark when Rose gets back and finds him reading her journal. They get comfy near the hearth shortly after, and Rose gets to know the kid more closely. As it turns out, he has some understanding of how infidelity destroys people and relationships. Her mother seems to have done away with herself after her father cheated on her. The boy hasn't spoken with his father since he was 14. But after many years, he keeps accepting the money he sends him. He tells three other stories about himself then, but we don't get to know which of them are true. What is evident, however, is that he's a very talented keyboard player. Two emotionally lost individuals sleep on one mattress, and in the morning, stroll around the streets. Rose notices an advertisement for Emma's yoga class, dashes inside the store, and shreds it to pieces reactively. Taken by the rage, she acts almost unconsciously, and recollects herself only after the flyer is completely destroyed. Now she cannot know anything about the yoga class or Emma's number. 
From this point on, she endeavors to find another one of the advertisements around the town, but it seems to have been the only one. That evening, she calls her husband again and immerses herself in a long session of shouting and cursing at him again. The rushing stream of insults leaves her body for a good while, but suddenly, she is told something that quiets her immediately. For the first time, we see her calming down. She thanks the person on the other side of the call and hangs up slowly and silently. We don't get to know what was said to her over the phone, but we do see her actions moving forward. Returning home, she decides to play a little role-play game with the boy. She dresses him up as a girl, changes herself into a man's clothes, and goes out. The game they play stars two individuals meeting by the shore and going to a bar afterwards. Masculine Rose tries her best to seduce the boy, and it all goes to a point where we're not sure that he still likes it. When Rose leans over to kiss him, he acts reluctantly and clearly gets out of his girl character, but Rose fails to notice it and kisses him anyway. She seems to be completely drawn by the game, perhaps because she is so eager to escape reality. Going over to a toilet in the next scene, she notices Emma's advertisement again, takes it off the wall slowly, and calls her. Continuing to play the role of somebody else, Rose doesn't speak with her as herself. Instead, when the call goes to a voicemail, she speaks as if she were her husband. Speaking in a masculine voice again, Rose tells Emma how boring and crazy his wife is, how fat he got, and how marrying her was the worst mistake of his life. Then he praises her, underlining how satisfying it is to sleep with her and to forget about Rose with her. He finishes up by pointing out how he never loved Rose and leaving the bar alone. For a while, she strolls around the streets in solitude, as back in the bar, the boy begins to be disappointed in himself. He seems to regret taking part in the game. When Rose finally returns to the place, she finds him in the middle of everybody's attention, Behind a keyboard, he entertains the entire company gathered in the bar, and seeing him, Rose feels a glimmer of disappointment in herself as well. Moving her lips, she apologizes to him as the crowd explodes in applause. The next morning, we see the boy entering the yoga place by himself. As it seems, he's been sent by Rose to check the waters. A girl meets him and tells him that Emma was unable to start a class due to a lack of participants. Forced to turn the boy away, she suddenly sees Rose, and her expressions change abruptly. As it turns out, the two are childhood friends. The girl's face brightens, and she offers Rose to participate in yoga classes that are available, but Rose's face remains indifferent. Cold to the girl's affection, she turns down her offer and walks out of the building, leaving the boy alone. The latter introduces himself as Rose's boyfriend from England, and informs the surprised girl that they are definitely staying in town. The girl knows that Rose is married, so she gets confused for a moment before deciding not to meddle in others' business. She offers him to go on a dance on Sunday, adding that Emma will be there too. The boy is delighted to hear this invitation. He remembers the name of the place well and walks outside, where Rose is waiting for him. With no destination in mind, they spend the sunny evening on the streets of Delaware. They seem to enjoy each other's company, finding comfort in each other's presence, when the sun sets, the boy takes Rose to a place he particularly loves. It is an empty dance studio with a piano and a stage. Holding hands, they walk inside and take their places. We learn here that Rose is extremely proficient in tap dancing. After an initial goofy attitude, the boy changes the tone, and the gear is shifted. As Rose follows the music, following no particular dance schools, the boy watches her, and a wide range of emotions are reflected in his expressions. In this moment, they are strangely connected while diving deep into themselves at the same time. The boy seems particularly drawn to her in this moment. That night, he sees her sleeping with a hat on and slowly takes it off of her. He takes a moment to watch her, then starts gently brushing his fingers across her hair. Rose clearly begins to play an enormous role in his life. The next morning, they go fishing. The man who owns the gear doesn't promise that they are going to catch a fish. As he says, it depends on their fishing skills, and even though they are probably not that proficient in this line of work, they decide to try it out anyway. After being taught how to use a flying rod, they wait for a bite and rest their eyes on the wide horizon, until the boy feels pressure on his string. He gets confused at first, but soon, with the help of quick guidance, he manages to catch an enormous fish. Rose learns how to collect as much meat from it as possible in the next scene, and that night, the two prepare it for supper. 
After one hilarious historical detour about Thanksgiving and quite a bit of struggling, the meal is served. The fire is set in the hearth, and not wanting to go to sleep right away, they spend some time together in silence. Rose gets honestly interested in one thing. She has noticed that the boy almost never smiles, and is interested in the reason behind it. The boy says that it's his teeth. He's extremely self-conscious about them. Rose insists on seeing them now, and he won't get away until he yields to her will. Reluctantly, he shows his teeth, and Rose is assured that they are not that terrible. Sharing the part of himself he likes the least, the boy feels completely naked in front of Rose, and seeing her accept him wholly and thoroughly, his heart begins to race. Rose kisses her index finger and puts it on his teeth. She does it a couple of times, until the boy leans towards her reactively and kisses her firmly. Rose doesn't resist it. When the boy breaks away, it is she who feels a strong gravity toward him. The irresistible emotion this moment brings to the boy forces him to speak in the most romantic manner. Not attending to his speech, he says that he would marry her. Rose doesn't take these words too seriously, of course. Perfectly attuned to the situation, she falls on the mattress sideways and listens to the boy as he continues to speak about the prospect of having children. Discussing the future in this easy-going manner seems to bring pleasure to both. As firewood continues to crackle in her heart, Rose keeps talking about their children until, half embracing each other, they doze into sleep. The next morning, the boy looks at himself in the mirror and exposes his teeth. For the first time in his life, he is okay with every part of himself. Bright-faced, a wide smile stretches beneath his nose, until he begins looking for the perfect attire for today. Meanwhile, Rose intends to do the same thing, and we understand that they are actually planning to carry out the mission that was cooked up last night, they are going to role-play a wedding. Compared to the previous one, this is a role-play game the boy is delighted to take part in. The morning holds enormous meaning to both as they slowly begin to look like a couple from the past. The boy gets a sophisticated wooden cane with a silver grip and a proper British cylinder, while Rose fits inside a dazzling laced white dress. Posing in front of a camera in the next scene, they look like a delightful couple. While the photos are being prepared for them, the boy steps outside for a minute to find the perfect wedding gift for his wife. Checking out one of the shops, he finds a wonderful talisman. It is a beautiful silver cup that comes with a silver spoon. It almost seems as if the dish wouldn't go well with any other spoon, while the spoon wouldn't fit in with any other cup. They are created for each other, and to the boy, it is a perfect metaphor for his relationship with Rose. He is delighted to see the pictures in the next scene. Excited to think that they actually got married, they celebrate this occasion in one of the most unfit of places, a graveyard. Treading through headstones, Rose looks for a perfect spot, and, after finding it, states that this is where she's going to be buried. The boy is a little confused by her behavior. Rose seems to be thinking far into the future, and for a moment, the boy is unable to understand why she even bothers to think of such things. When Rose lies down on the ground, he hangs around reluctantly, not being sure what it would mean to join her. Finally, yielding to his fate, he makes a decision and kneels down beside her. This is a moment when he accepts to spend not only his lifetime with her, but the afterlife as well. Brushing his hand across her body slowly, he kisses her, and takes a minute to soak up the importance and melancholy of the moment in full. Suddenly he asks her if she will ever hurt him, and after getting no response, he rolls over to his place. He looks for the perfect dress to buy for Rose in the next scene. Finally, he manages to get his hands on an 18th century colonial dress, and getting back home, he watches Rose as she tries to fit in the attire. Together, they go over to a place where Sunday dances are held and sign in. Soon, the girl who invited the boy to the dance appears in the hall. Rose had no idea that she was going to be here, so she acts confused when Emma's friend comes up to them and greets them cheerfully. Rose states that they are married to each other, and the moment becomes increasingly awkward until the moment is neutralized, and the afternoon continues to be delightful. All of this, however, until Emma appears in the hall as well, Rose fails to notice her at first. She keeps on dancing around the group until she ends up standing right in front of her. Rose loses control over her behavior immediately. Dashing in Emma's direction reactively, she nudges her backwards, tries to get her on the floor, and runs after her when she tries to escape. When the boy finally manages to catch up with them, he sees Rose on top of Emma, trying to suffocate her. Her face is shaking in rage, 
and it almost seems as if she will actually go as far as to murder her. But after seeing the boy's face, she lets her go and starts sobbing uncontrollably. Screaming and crying, she covers her face and falls into a mode of utter desperation. The boy can do nothing but stand beside her in this moment. We don't see how this dramatic episode ends. We only see the boy facing the Atlantic Ocean in the next scene, as a single tear rolls down from his eye. That evening, they drive away from Delaware in silence. As we soon learn, Rose is endeavoring to see her husband again. The boy is asked if he wants to be left at the airport, but he says that he prefers to see the husband as well. Sadly, it is clear that their relationship is approaching its inevitable end. No other words are spoken as the whole day passes on the road. It is already the next morning when Rose's car appears in her husband's driveway. The man is sweeping his backyard when his wife enters through the fence, approaching him with an empty expression and glassy eyes. Rose stands in front of him for a while. The boy, who's remaining behind the fence in this moment, sees how the husband invites Rose for a hug, and how the two embrace each other firmly. There is a lot of love and affection expressed in this motion, and the boy finds it difficult to watch while his heart is swarmed by some strong emotion. After giving Rose a passionate kiss, the husband notices him and asks what he is doing there. The question is asked in such an impolite manner that the boy finds himself running in his direction, looking for a fight right away. They end up lying on the grass, and for a moment Rose finds the moment quite entertaining, until she sees the raised fist of her husband and the helpless state of the boy. Rose stops it immediately and introduces the boy as her friend. The husband doesn't care about knowing him at all. Making sure that his wife is back, he walks inside the house in a laid-back manner and leaves the two outside. The boy apologizes for his explosiveness to Rose then, and listens to her as she states that she will go inside for just a moment and be back right away. He kneels down in sorrow after she disappears behind the door. It would be extremely heartbreaking for him to see how the couple is reunited inside. As the two embrace one another firmly, he sits on the ground until deciding to stand straight, take a deep breath, and do what seems right. When Rose comes outside to take a good look around the backyard, she sees no trail of the boy, but a gift put on a chair near the fence. Walking over to it, she takes it in her hands and reflects on what happened in Delaware. We don't see what's inside, but we have a good idea of what it must be. And so, the dish and the spoon are comfortingly placed in Rose's hands as the boy makes his way along a sidewalk with a damp, drizzly November in his soul, 